produced by American Medical Video, which is solely responsible for its content. This Milestones in Medicine program is funded through a grant provided by Park Davis. If our present habits continue, one of us uh, will die from uh, consequences of atherosclerosis in our arteries. One of, of every two Americans die from atherosclerosis. Fifty percent of the population. Uh, it is the plague of the 20th century, no question about it. two decades, Dr. William Roberts has played a prominent role in our nation's efforts to eradicate atherosclerotic heart disease. Dr. Roberts is chief of the pathology branch of the National Institutes of Health. Many of his contributions to our current understanding of atherosclerosis have been made in the solitude of the research laboratory. His astute descriptions of a wide variety of cardiovascular disorders have appeared in more than a thousand scientific publications. Dr. Roberts has also made significant contributions in preparing future physicians and scientists for the battle against heart disease. He holds faculty positions at several medical schools in the Washington, D.C. area, and he's won numerous honors in that capacity, including the Gifted Teacher Award of the American College of Cardiology. In recent years, Dr. Roberts has waged an outspoken campaign against those lifestyle factors that contribute to the development of heart disease especially lack of exercise and diets that are high in cholesterol and saturated fats. As the editor-in-chief of the American Journal of Cardiology, he frequently makes use of lively, thought-provoking editorials to comment on the destructive habits of modern man. During a recent conversation in his office at the NIH, Dr. Roberts spoke to us about the weight of the evidence linking diet, high blood cholesterol, and atherosclerotic heart disease. Uh, I remember years ago, I believe uh, 1967, I had a trip to Kampala, Uganda, and I spent a week examining hearts, uh, aortas of, of uh, people living in Uganda, and uh, I must have examined 500 hearts and aortas in a week, and I hardly saw an atherosclerotic plaque. And yet these people uh, had uh, very high blood pressure. At least the frequency of hypertension was very high among that population. Uh, the hearts I was examining, for example, uh, were, was, many of them were, were quite uh, big. They were smoking a lot of cigarettes in Kampala, Uganda in 1967, but I didn't see any atherosclerotic plaques uh, for practical purposes. And the reason is their total cholesterol level in their blood was 110, 100, 90. Uh, these people were not eating uh, red meat uh, uh, every day. Uh, they weren't uh, feeding themselves the percent of fat as a percent of calories that we as Americans eat every day. Average cholesterol here in America in people over 40 years of age is about uh, 210 to 215. Uh, now, if the cholesterol is that level, uh, and if the blood pressure is elevated, it clearly accelerates the process, but not if the, if the cholesterol level is way down. And the same, I think, can uh, go for smoking, cigarette smoking. Cigarette smoking is obviously bad for the lungs, and uh, uh, cancer of the lung is extremely rare without smoking. But if one's total cholesterol is 90 or 100 or 120, cigarette smoking uh, does not accelerate atherosclerosis, in my judgment. 
a lot of cigarette smokers in Japan, but their total cholesterol level averages about 150. And uh, so smoking uh, does not devastate their population from a cardiovascular standpoint as it, as it does over here. And the more fat we eat, the more cholesterol we eat, the more atherosclerotic plaques we have, uh, the greater the chance we have of developing symptomatic heart disease, the greater the chance we have of dying from it, the greater the amount of plaque in our bodies. Uh, the relationship, the connection is as firm as any clinical connection uh, can ever be. And in my view, uh, the link between cholesterol and atherosclerotic plaques would hold up in any court in any land. Cholesterol stands accused of playing a primary role in the development of atherosclerosis. Well, today we're going to try and give the cholesterol issue a fair hearing. At the end of our program, we'll invite you to share your verdict with us. The initial evidence linking diet to atherosclerosis and atherosclerotic plaque to cholesterol dates back to pre-revolutionary Russia. The link uh, between cholesterol and atherosclerotic plaques uh, started entirely in this century. Uh, it was 1912 by a Russian uh, named Anishkow who fed high-fat uh, diets and he identified in those fats uh, uh, the substance of cholesterol. And he, he fed these diets to rabbits. And I must say that we as human beings have a lot of similarities to rabbits. Uh, and uh, produced in those animals uh, cholesterol plaque, atherosclerotic plaques similar to those occurring in humans. And that was 1912, and those studies have been repeated by many uh, other people. Following the classic experiment of Anichkov, additional evidence supporting the relationship between cholesterol and atherosclerosis came from the biochemistry laboratory and from epidemiologic studies. Now, the second uh, 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 poor link came about from the biochemist. And biochemists analyzed these atherosclerotic plaques in non-human animals, namely rabbits and a few other species, and also in the atherosclerotic plaques in humans, and found cholesterol in those uh, uh, plaques. So uh, if you feed cholesterol, it produced ather atherosclerotic plaques, and in the plaques, there is cholesterol. And then the third uh, uh, link uh, came really right after World War II. And this was uh, from the studies by Ansel Keys and his colleagues. And I really consider uh, Ansel Keys a, a, a great man. Uh, I think his contributions have been wonderful. But the major study he did was, was to go to these seven nations uh, on the planet, uh, Japan, Greece, uh, USA, uh, uh, Finland, uh, and three others. And they studied um, a, a large body of people in each of these seven nations. Uh, and in certain areas in these uh, nations, uh, the people they studied, they found a, a very high frequency of atherosclerotic disease in some nations and a very low frequency in others. Japan, for example, and most of these, this data was collected in the 1950s, some in the 1960s. It was not published till 1970. But in Japan, for example, the frequency of, uh, of um, coronary disease, either symptomatic or fatal or both, was very low. And in Greece, it was quite low. Uh, in the USA, it was very high, and Finland had the highest of all. Now, what uh, Ansel Keys and his colleagues found was that the average total cholesterol of adults in Japan at that time was approximately 150 milligrams per deciliter. In uh, Finland, which had the highest uh, levels, um, the total cholesterol averaged nearly 300 milligrams per deciliter. In other words, twice as much. And, uh, and the people in Finland were the frequency of death from coronary disease and other consequences of atherosclerosis was very high, and in Japan, it was very low. Now, Ansel Keys concluded from his studies that this was a cholesterol problem, and that if we uh, diminish the amount of cholesterol we take in, 
And most of the cholesterol we take in is not from cholesterol itself, it's from fat, which when it gets into our body is converted into cholesterol. Uh, he concluded it was a cholesterol problem. The findings of Ansel Keys have been reinforced by additional epidemiologic studies, identifying elevated serum cholesterol as a major risk factor for atherosclerotic heart disease. For example, the results of the Framingham Heart Study, which followed more than 5,000 randomly selected men and women for upwards of 28 years, led to the conclusion that despite the multifactorial nature of coronary artery disease, the lipids are the most fundamental to the basic process. But the most damaging evidence has come from the multiple risk factor intervention trial, also known as Mr. Fit a massive prospective study funded by the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. In my judgment, uh, it's the Mr. Fitz study, uh, and Jerry uh, Stamlow was the man behind this one. That study shows beyond any reasonable doubt that, that our chances of getting atherosclerotic disease and its consequence is purely proportional to the quantity of cholesterol in our blood. In other words, the higher the quantity, the greater the risk, and it's as simple as that. Uh, they studied in Chicago, and the beauty of that study is that they studied 356,000 people. Uh, they sampled uh, all those people for blood, for cholesterol, blood pressure, smoking habits, and so on. The initial um, uh, follow-up was six years. And they showed in six years, as the cholesterol level went up, uh, the mortality from coronary artery disease uh, went up uh, uh, proportional uh, to that. So far, the evidence we've presented has shown that the higher the serum cholesterol level, the greater the risk of developing significant heart disease. Well, now let's listen as Dr. Roberts discusses two milestone studies which demonstrate that lowering cholesterol levels decreases the chances of both fatal and non-fatal atherosclerotic disease. Then the, uh, the next study uh, of importance uh, came in January 1984, and that was the, uh, the famous uh, Lipid Research Clinic study, which was initiated uh, by NIH. And this study showed, uh, in my view, beyond any reasonable doubt, that if the total and specifically the uh, uh, LDL cholesterol level, uh, levels are lowered in our bloodstream, that heart attack frequency drops. Now, what is heart attack frequency? In this study, which cost $158 million, incidentally, it's never going to be repeated in this country. It's just simply too expensive. We have to accept these results. It showed that, that uh, in the, the, these were men, all men, asymptomatic when they entered the study. They were approximately uh, 47 years of age, and they were all followed seven years. Half of the group was treated with cholestyramine, and the other half uh, placebo. And at the end of seven years, those uh, uh, put in the treatment group, and about 30 percent of them uh, quit taking the drug, but they stayed in that uh, that arm of the study, there was a 19% reduction in heart attack compared to placebo at the end of seven years, 19%. Now, heart attack in that study was hard endpoints. It meant fatal coronary artery disease or non-fatal infarction. But at the same time, the frequency of appearance of angina pectoris diminished roughly 20%. The frequency of appearance of a positive exercise test dropped about 20 uh, percent, and the frequency of a need of, for bypass, coronary bypass operation, dropped about 25 percent in the treated group compared to the non-treated group. So anyway, in my view, that one looks at that study, uh, those who, who um, uh, received a lipid-lowering agent to lower their cholesterol level uh, did better than those uh, who did not. Now, all of those patients uh, were on a, on a diet. The LRC study, uh, in summary, in essence, uh, showed for the first time that it pays to lower one's total and LDL cholesterol levels, and if that's done, heart attack frequency drops. In other words, when that patient walks into your office and says, Doctor, if I get my cholesterol level down, will my chances of having a heart attack be reduced? The answer is 
unequivocally uh, yes. Now, follow, following the Lipid Research Clinic study was the Helsinki Heart Study. Uh, this took place in Finland, of course, and in my view, it's even a better study in a way than the Lipid Research Clinic study. Uh, they, too, followed um, uh, about 4,000 men. The average age was about 47. Uh, their total cholesterol levels, for the most part, were over 265 milligrams per deciliter, the same as in the Lipid Research Clinic study. In other words, they, they, they studied people with very high levels. Only 5% of Americans uh, have total cholesterol levels over 265. But at any rate, the drug used in this study was gemfibrozil. Half of the patients received that drug, 1.2 grams per day for five years, or at least they, about 30% of them quit taking it, but they stayed in that drug uh, treatment arm. And then the other half were given placebo. And at the end of five years, there was a 34% reduction in heart attack frequency in the drug-treated group compared to the placebo group. The Lipid Research Clinic study had been only a 19% uh, reduction in heart attack frequency in the treatment group compared to the non-treatment group. Now, why the difference, 34% and 19%? I'm not sure about that, but I think it's the fact that the total and LDL cholesterol levels in the Helsinki Heart Study did not drop. Indeed, they went up 1%. And although the uh, total and LDL cholesterol levels uh, with gemfibrozil came down at the end of five years, only an average of about 9%, uh, because the placebo levels did not fall, that 9% was transferred immediately to the bottom line, and there was a much uh, sharper reduction in heart attack. In the Lipid Research Clinic study, in contrast, the, the, the total and LDL cholesterol levels in the placebo group fell approximately 8%. So the levels in the drug treatment arm of that study had to fall considerably more in order to show a difference. Indeed, the, the total and LDL cholesterol levels in the placebo arm of the Lipid Research Clinic study fell almost as much as in the treatment arm of the Helsinki Heart Study. But at any rate, both of these studies show the same thing, and that is it pays to lower one's total and LDL cholesterol level, and if that's done, heart attack frequency uh, will drop. While the primary prevention trials, such as the LRC and Helsinki, have demonstrated a clear, direct relationship between serum cholesterol and atherosclerosis, the so-called regression studies have made the case against cholesterol even stronger. The most recent and dramatic of these investigations is the cholesterol-lowering atherosclerosis study, also referred to as CLASS. Now, the final uh, uh, bit of evidence to complete this puzzle of the link between cholesterol and atherosclerosis came with the regression studies. Now, it's, it's well known in non-human animals that if one produces atherosclerosis by giving these high-fat, high-cholesterol diets, atherosclerotic plaques are, are produced, and then if the animal is taken off those high-fat, high-cholesterol diets, the plaques will gradually regress, or at least uh, portions of them. Now, the uh, Black and Horn study, which was published in uh, June 1987, is the best one, in my view, of the regression studies. Now, what Black and Horn and his colleagues did was take a group of 162 people who had already had a bypass operation some as long as seven years earlier. And all of these 162 people, they did coronary angiogram, and then they divided them into two groups. One half the group they treated with this combination of, of niacin and uh, cholesterol, and the other half would receive no drug therapy. Both were on uh, a, a low-fat diet. And then at the end of two years, they repeated the coronary angiograms again, and lo and behold, uh, the uh, group who uh, had received the drug therapy had a significantly less uh, uh, percent of progression of lesions during that two-year period of time. Now, what that means is this. That is, if a narrowing uh, is, is quite narrow, it did not get worse during that period of time. And the frequency of lack of progression was much higher in the drug treatment group than the in the non-drug treatment group, 
And the second thing, and the most important, of course, was that there was a significantly higher frequency of regression in the drug treatment group. Now, what that means, of course, is that a narrowing may have been quite severe, and during that two years on a lipid-lowering drugs, uh, the, the narrowing got less narrow. Now, this is the only way to, to get evidence for regression during life is by coronary angiography. Uh, one can't do an autopsy uh, but one, so you can't look at an uh, atherosclerotic plaque one time and then come back and look at it again to see whether portions of it have disappeared. But the evidence is strong, both experimentally and now in human beings, that if one has atherosclerotic plaques, and if one diminishes the amount of, of lipids uh, one takes in, that these plaques, uh, at least portions of them, will, will uh, uh, disappear a bit. So regression is, a, is with us, and I think it's going to be the big, the big push uh, in the next decade. The other thing that's, that appeals to me so much about the Blankenhorn study is that, is that uh, they, took, uh, they divided their 162 patients into those who initially had total cholesterol levels greater than 240 and into another group of, in whom the initial total cholesterol levels were less than 240. And what they found was that the percent reduction in total and LDL cholesterols in those two groups was essentially the same. Now that's very important because the lipid research clinic studies and the Helsinki heart study only took people with very high cholesterol levels initially, a very relatively small portion of the population. The Blankenhorn study shows that, uh, that uh, if you start with lower levels, you can achieve considerable reduction uh, in, in those levels. And that's a very important aspect of that study to me. Well, the evidence is in. But before you reach a verdict, let's summarize the case that's been made against cholesterol. We've heard testimony that when certain animal species are fed a high cholesterol diet, they develop atherosclerotic plaques similar to those found in humans. We've heard that cholesterol is a major component of atherosclerotic lesions, and that the higher the serum cholesterol level, the greater the extent of heart disease. We've also heard evidence that lowering the cholesterol level decreases the chances of developing significant atherosclerotic disease and may also result in regression of sclerotic lesions. Well, now that you've had an opportunity to examine the evidence, what's your verdict on the cholesterol issue? Please write us at the address appearing on your television screen. We look forward to hearing from you. We've got to remember that uh, with a population of 245 million people, 25% of Americans over age 40 have total cholesterols over 240, 25%. 5% have total cholesterols over 265. Now these people are sitting on a time bomb and uh, they're not gonna see their kids grow up and they're not gonna be grandparents if they don't get those cholesterol levels down. This Milestones in Medicine program has been funded through a grant provided by Park Davis.